And I want to begin with kind of an interesting story. A couple of years ago, maybe you recall in the news that there were 12 boys from a soccer team and their coach who found themselves trapped in a cave in Thailand. How many of you remember that story? Uh, they, they, were, they were trapped there for 17 days. Now, the good news is they were all completely safely rescued, and we're grateful for that. But one of the kind of the back stories of, of this great rescue is a, a, about a man by the name of Elon Musk. Have you heard of him? He uh, is the, a billionaire. He's the owner of uh, two companies, one called Tesla, one called SpaceX. How many of you ever heard of those? Okay, so, so this guy's got a lot of unique resources, and, you know, things at his disposal. And when he heard about these kids that were trapped in this cave, he decided he was going to do something about it. He called, you know, all of the smart guys that he has working for him, and, and they kind of came up with a, try to come up with a plan where they could where they could do something and so what happened was they actually wound up building like a miniature submarine to try to rescue these kids and and uh, so once the once the submarine was complete Elon Musk this billionaire and you know his team they all flew to Thailand and and brought that over there and and where these boys were trapped and and uh, interestingly enough uh you know, they put it together and tried to work with it. And after several attempts, those who were running the rescue operation decided not to use the submarine, okay? And so what is interesting uh, is, is about what he does next, what Elon Musk does next, okay? Uh, he decides he's just going to stay behind with hundreds of other volunteers, you know, and just ask what he can do. In other words, you know, he doesn't jump ship just because they didn't use his gift. He doesn't sit around and cause problems because, you know, they did not use his invention. He didn't pick up the attitude of, hey, don't they know who I am and all the things I've accomplished? He's not offended. He's not whining. He's not complaining. He just shifts gears, rolls up his sleeves and say, whatever you else, another way I can help. To, 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 to just let me know. And, uh, you know, he doesn't go back to the Thailand government and say, you know, hey, I want my submarine back. You didn't use it. No, he actually, he leaves the submarine there in case they need it in other, in other uh, rescues. Uh, and so the media, of course, is all trying to get him to say something negative about the government of Thailand because they didn't use this submarine. But all he ever says is, I'm just grateful that the boys and their coats were rescued. All right? And so I think that the church of Jesus Christ could learn something from this billionaire Elon Musk. He's brilliant, he's wealthy, he's talented, and he was willing to use his resources that he had, but yet in the end none of those were used, but, but, what, but what he still was able to do was say, look, I'm willing to get down into the dirty, muddy waters and do whatever's necessary, and I think that that's the kind of attitude that God wants for his church to have. How many of you think that's true? Elon Musk had the attitude of a servant, all right? And so let me just first of all say that God is looking for servants in his kingdom. In fact, I love Matthew chapter 23 and verse 11. It says, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. In other words, God is elevating, Jesus is elevating those who are willing to serve. And how many of you realize that in the kingdom of God, we use the word volunteer a lot? How many of you ever heard that? Volunteer. Uh, you know, but, but to tell the truth, you really can't find the word volunteer in the New Testament anywhere. It's simply not in there. In fact, volunteer is kind of a secular word. And so let me just give you the truth this morning, okay? The truth is that we are, were created to serve. Tell your neighbor, you were created to serve the Lord. Amen. Ephesians 2 and 10 says this, that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so this verse tells us that God knew 
that, the, that, that we would all be here in 2020 at this exact moment. He knew the past that you would go down. He knew the time of, that you would live in. And even before he founded the planet, he said, look, I've got things planned that you're going to do, good works that you're going to do, and you're going to walk and live in them, right? And, and, and I believe we ought to attempt to do that, right? And I believe that's ca- our calling, right? How many of you ever heard about a calling, right? Everybody has a calling. Your calling is what God created you to do. Your calling is not your career. Now, those two may intersect and intermingle, and that's okay. But your career is how you make money. Your calling is what you're created to do in Jesus. And I believe that being a Christian, being a real disciple of Jesus. How many of you want to be a real disciple today? A real disciple doesn't just come to church and sit on purple pews. uh, Chairs. We don't have pews, okay? Purple chairs to hear the pastor preach. A real disciple says, look, I'm going to in and I want to serve, right? Yeah, and so, and so, in fact, actually, this is what Jesus said. He said that if you and I walk in our calling, that greater works will we do than even the works that Jesus did. That, those are incredible words. Let me read that verse, John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me. Does anybody believe in Jesus today? Come on. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And, and when it comes to doing these great works, you know, the, the, the New Testament doesn't say we should volunteer. The New Testament's word that is used all throughout it is the word servant. You see, it takes a servant's heart to be able to fulfill the calling that God has created for you. And you might start out as a volunteer, but there's a moment when you've got to leave off of volunteerism and develop that servant's heart. And a servant's heart always says that our service ought to glorify God. Come on. I love Matthew 5 and verse 16. says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. And so when we serve, the goal is that those around us see something inside of us or some action that we do that causes God to be glorified. If all you ever do is volunteer, eventually, now follow with me, you could have an attitude that could cause a problem, right? You start thinking things like, boy, they're really lucky I'm here. You, you, you better treat me right or else, you know, I, I might volunteer somewhere else. Uh, if you don't treat me right, then I might go negative and, you know, I might get disgruntled and, you know, I might, you know, just, you know, give others a piece of my mind. And if all you're doing is volunteering, you, you might say, hey, don't really ask me to put myself out and don't demand things of me. Don't, don't ask me to inconvenience myself because after all, I'm just volunteering. I'm not getting paid to do this stuff. So you really can't expect that much out of me. In other words, what that person is doing is they're not focusing on others. They're focusing on themselves. How many of you see the drift I'm getting to? Come on. But if you have a heart of a servant, what you say is, I don't have any demands. I don't have any agenda. Uh, My only question is, how can I best glorify my Father that's in heaven? How can I bring glory and honor to Him? Just tell me, wherever the need is the greatest, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. No problem. My heart is to do whatever it takes. And I'll tell you, you know, you, you don't know that you're a servant until you've been treated like one. Come on, somebody. And I can assure you that if you're in church long enough, over time, you're here long enough, you're going to run into people as you have trying to serve God and honor God. You're going to run into people along the way that will actually answer your prayer when you pray like this, Lord, if you can use anything, use me. And as guess what? As God starts to use you, all of a sudden you're going to say, hey, you know what? It just seems like all they want to do is use me. <laughs> well, let me tell you, what we need to do is have the attitude of a bondservant. In fact, that's what Paul called himself. That's what Peter called himself in Romans and 2 Peter. We ought to have the attitude of a bondservant. You see, in Bible times, 
when you would be talking about slavery in the, in the Jewish tradition. You know, a lot of people look at, at slavery, you know, and, and they think of the modern world perspective on slavery. And a lot of people criticize the Old Testament when it talks about slavery, but they don't really understand what was behind all of that. If you'd like to read about this later on, you can look it up in Exodus 21. But they don't understand the Jewish tradition behind slavery. And so let me explain it to you for a moment. Let's say that you were to run up a debt that you couldn't pay and you had no way to pay the debt. You didn't have, of course, back in those days, how many realized you didn't have bankruptcy or any of these other options, right? So the only option that was available was being thrown in a prison because you couldn't pay the debt. And the only way you could get out of prison was for somebody to come along and pay that debt for you. And so if somebody was wealthy enough to pay off your debt, they would literally be buying you out of prison prison. So if someone had compassion on you and they paid the debt off, you would have to work for them according to Exodus chapter 21 for six years and then the seventh years uh, you, would, you would be uh, free. There would be no obligation. You're good. You're done. All your, your debts are paid. You can have a fresh start. But you see what would happen every once in a while is that, that there would be somebody who would realize they were so glad that that person had rescued them from prison. They realized in the sixth years of service, they didn't really pay the debt off completely. Uh, they might have paid a little bit of it, and they were so grateful for the way the master had treated them and rescued them, showed compassion on them, uh, that they would actually say, you know, even though the law says I don't want, uh, you know, that I can be free in the seventh year, uh, I don't think I want that. I want to willingly stay behind and serve my master. And so if they would do this, here's what they would do, all right? Are you with me? Still with me? They would literally go to a doorpost and they would take an awl, kind of like a nail, and they would put it through that person's ear, and that, and, and that, would, that person would become what's called a bondservant. That would mark the person as a bondservant. And a bondservant, how many of you are with me? A bondservant isn't required to serve. It's not someone who's required to do something. No, a bondservant is someone who willingly wants to serve out of gratitude because of everything that the master had showed them. And it's important that we understand that that's what God calls us to be, a willing bondservant. Now, the good news is today we're not going to get a nail and put, you know, put it through people's ear. Aren't you glad for that today? Okay, we're not going to do that, and God doesn't call us to do. But when we read Peter and when we read Paul and you hear them saying they're a bondservant, that's what he was referring to. They were saying, look, I serve willingly because of everything that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me. He brought me out of a place of prison. He brought me out of a place where a debt, he paid a debt for me. I could and pay, and that's why I'm willing to serve him. And uh, by the way, that's really the least that we can do, right? When we consider what Jesus, our chief servant, did for us. Come on. How many of you know that Jesus did more than have his ear pierced through with a nail? Come on, somebody. Amen. They put Jesus Christ on a cross. He took the nails in his feet. He took the nails in his hand. He died there to pay our debt. Come on, somebody. He died a horrible, blood-soaked uh, death on a cross for you and for me. He laid down his life. And the least that we can do is say to him, Lord, I'm grateful and I want to serve you. I want to be willing to do that. Now, I, 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 I want to talk to you for a moment about that verse I just read a moment ago that talks about greater miracles, right? And don't, I've, I love that verse. Don't you love that verse? Wow, talk about incredible and encouraging and mind-boggling. Jesus healed the sick, right? He caused the lame to walk. He said, you'll do these works and other works. And so this week I was thinking about that verse and I thought, what was the greatest work that Jesus Christ ever did? How many of you know that it was the cross, right? The day that they hung Jesus on the cross, he became obedient to death. He became a bondservant. He died there for you and for me. They put the nails through his hands. That was the greatest work that Jesus Christ ever did. It's a completed work. Come on, somebody. It's a finished work. It's done. Our sins have been paid. 
And so as I was thinking about this whole idea of running it all through my ear, through someone's ear, I thought, you know something, the greatest work that we can actually do for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is adopt within ourselves the idea and the thought that we are bond servants. Come on, that we can adopt that as a mentality that we have. Come on. I'm so grateful for all that the Lord has done. Amen.